so much, Nandini, for those kind words and for being a, a role model for uh, that kind of community building. Um, uh, I want to thank Maura, Matthew, and Jordan for making this conference possible. Um, I would also like to acknowledge Meredith Millar, uh, I'm, who is not here, but who is right now at this moment teaching Antigone for me. And so I am grateful for that. And I'm grateful for Caroline to reminding me something that I have forgotten, but it is rele very relevant for my talk, that today um, is, is Virgil's birthday. And so happy birthday, Virgil. Um, I am happy to celebrate uh, life um, in this really, I promise, unplanned <laughs> uh, fortuitous opportunity. So great. So if tasked with identifying a historical representation of work-life integration of Antalettre, I think we can do no better than the organizational chart of the New York and Erie Railroad that was designed by D.C. McCallum in 1854. Described as the first modern org chart, this remarkable specimen of design makes innovative use of corporate intellectual property to create a simple and streamlined infographic representation of the company's data flows. Rather than organizing this structure of power in a top-down pyramid, as most modern organizational charts do, McCallum places the directors and presidents at the bottom and depicts the rest of the company organized along the five lines of the railroad as growing like a plant out of the administrative seed. And so here we can see some of the details of that. We see the um, different jobs represented um, all the way down to the to the leaves and berries. Indeed, what is perhaps most impressive in formal terms about this um, image is that it represents the company as three overlapping forms, a power hierarchy, a plant, and a map. In this way, the image strikes the reader as a remarkably effective piece of corporate rhetoric that presents a positive view of the, of corporate power and puts the employees with the least amount of power in the distinctive position of leaves and fruits, essential components of the company's reproduction and the operation of daily photosynthesis of bustling commuters. Of course, when viewed from a perspective critical of capitalism, these syntheses uh, are revealed to be no, little more than a beautiful lie. It, rep it conceals power relations and inequalities by figuring them as forms of growth and extension out of a central seed. The positions that constitute the form of corporation metaphorically grow out of other lower positions down the branches. In this sense, the lower positions provide the conditions for life of the organism. In reality, the positions are subservient to the ones growing beneath them and their viability depends upon them. The relationship of growth and power are thus inverted. This deception is betrayed no more clearly than in a detail at the bottom, the one metaphor on the image that is neither botanical nor cartographic mediates the representation between the board of directors and president. It is in fact arrows. The arrows that point from one figure to the another thus retool the relationship as a form of violent antagonism. This constellation of power in bare life or Zoe represented um, by this uh, pressing violence, ideological dark side, resembles the entanglement of life and labor winding its way through what I am calling the Virgilian project. With this phrase, I denote the, line uh, the lineage of writing that starts from the work of Virgil himself and extends afterwards all the way to the present day. I prefer the term project to tradition because I want to think about the lineage as one of transtemporal collaboration and rather than linear baton passing. My argument is that all along the works that constitute the Virgilian project, the tracks of labor and life cross, merge and diverge at intersections that are as perilous as they are potential. At these pregnant junctures, labor circumscribes, modifies, protects, snuffs out, and metamorphoses into life. Plant, animal, and human we tie, by contrast, grow into, constrict, crack, and blossom into labor. In the episodes I survey, work and life are neither always in harmony with each other or at each other's throats. Rather, Virgil and his readers choreograph waltzes of sympathy and antipathy that cause us to confront how the work we do, from reading to writing to farming and friending, is enmeshed in the business of living. I survey this enmeshment and co-constitution of work and life in three stages, or stops. First, I take a look at how the work 
the pruner or frondator casts a trimmed shadow over the plants and poems of the eclogues. In the second leg of our journey, I pass by the Virgilian biographies and consider how these texts con construct not bios, as most scholars have focused on, but zoe, bare life, in all its vigor and vulnerability. Finally, I turn at a more experimental angle to us and consider how the work life of the precariously employed classicist extends in the shade of the teeming Virgilian silwai. If there is any literary locale in which something like work-life integration can be detected, it's Virgil's Eclogues. The work, like the Georgics in the Aeneid, puts labor to work as an essential theme. At this stop on Virgil's literary career, it's typically recognize, recognized, labor has not yet taken on quite the same antagonistic valence that it would as part of its Georgic duties. It is also true that the genre employs a guild of those whom we might call lifeguards whose task it is to protect and foster living things. The preservation of animal life is of course the shepherd's primary vocation. If labor conquers all things is the trademark of Georgics one, love conquers all things still has a fighting chance in Arcadia. On the other hand, if bucolic labor is not yet in the business of conquering nature, it is inclined towards aggressive dealings and the lives touched by it are rarely unchanged. Shepherds steering their flocks are not hard pressed to spare the whip. They trap grasshoppers in reed baskets and scar tree trunks with poems and lovers' names for all its celebration of the fleeting ephemeral, in short. Pastoral does not typically hold its toilers to the standard of leaving no trace. The Virgilian is trained when faced with such contradictions to cry ambiguity. It could, we shrug, go either way. But here I think this critical impulse can lead to an ungenerous reading of what Virgil is doing. I suggest that rather than leaving readers to come to their own connections about the antipathy characterizing human and non-human relations, he is making a claim about the nature of their interaction and integration. To illustrate this, let us consider two moments in the eclogues from the first and last poems respectively, where humans relate to plants and animals through working and consider how those living things respond to or collaborate with that work. The archetype of the Virgilian lifeguard is the frondator, an agricultural laborer tasked with pruning trees and vines. The poem introduces him as here, here as a fixture of this idyllic landscape, singing at rest in harmony with birds typically represented as scared of humans. The presence of the rusticus in the bucolic ecosystem has elements of both sympathy and antipathy. On the one hand, his peaceful proximity to the birds is comparable to his supportive role on the vegetal, uh, to his vegetal charges, since the purpose of his trimming is not only to beautify the plants, but also to ensure their healthy growth, both for the pruned plants and for those uh, whose sunlight might be blocked by their spread. On the other hand, as is the case throughout Virgil's works, there is something inherently violent about cutting and cutting into plants. Not only is this the case uh, for the birds, once the frondator's break is over, will be shaken from the tree boughs with this encroachment on their leafy haunts. But violence in plant, at plants is in itself problematic for Virgil. This is made explicit by representations of angry farmers uprooting trees in the Georgics and many, many episodes of impious tree desecration in the Aeneid um, that have been studied by many people, uh, including um, um, Nandini. But as a recent article has argued, this tree violence is also represented in instances of shepherds carving large trees into poems, creating imminent risks of girdling and thus killing the trees with their opera. We'll see an example of that soon. Again, though, the point is not that Virgil is being ambivalent exactly. The work of the frondator here is helpful precisely because it is harmful. The violence against the leaves ultimately serves the purpose of bolstering plant vitality. This helpfulness of harm may be seen more clearly in paradoxical effect on the pastoral inhabitants complicit in the trimming in Eclogue 1. For one, the introduction of the frondator is part of the transition the characters must undergo from pastoralism to agriculture, and the characters lament that in this new world they must graft pears and put vines in order. What is more, though, the pruning potentially puts even the shady haunts of the shepherd in danger. 
the poem ends with our attentive uh, attention drawn to this when it's picture when it pictures the shepherd Titurus sitting beneath the same tree as he was at the opening only with one difference now he is sitting on a cushion of green leaves thus leaves that were recently taken from the tree uh, the added comfort of these leaves which i think we're supposed to connect to the project of the pruner will be temporary as soon they will harden die turn to dust and at best fertilize the ground for new young beaches to grow underneath Producing new leaves could help lower trees, but also harm the fruits of those trees themselves. They provide temporary comforts to the shepherds while ultimately threatening the habitat of their otium. Eclogue 10, which is the last work, Extremum Laborum of the collection, and which functions to honor Virgil's fellow poet Gallus, views the interweaving, this interweaving of work and life from a different perspective. Let's consider two passages from there. First, Virgil's Gallus says he will carve his amores into the arbores of the wilderness so that they'll grow on the ever expanding bark. This moment has typically been interpreted many, many times um, as a moment of attempted metapoetic synthesis between elegy represented by the written loves and pastoral represented by the inscribed trees. This image imagines a more sympathetic blending of work and growth figured as amores and arbores, even if it still requires the violent incision of the bark. And we can know from silvicultural writers like Theophrastus that this work of cutting trees, of, of, of making large incisions into bark could have the effect of, of, of harming or even killing the tree. Um, a still more seamless integration comes at the end of the poem when Virgil describes not Gallus's amores, but his own. This is a, an especially complex passage, so um, I'll read it aloud. Divine Pyrides, it will be enough for your poet to have sung these things while he sits and weaves a basket from slender hibiscus. You will make these things greatest for Gallus, Gallus for whom my love grows as much by hour as in spring, a green alder propagates itself by suckers when new spring when spring is new. Let us rise, surgamus. Shade tends to be oppressive to singers, that oppressive shade of the juniper. Shadows can be harmful to crops. Go home, sated goats, go home. Evening arrives. As scholars have long observed, the image of the shepherd weaving hibiscus is a recollection of the shepherd boy in the ecrisis of Theocritus Little One, who plates reeds into a basket for a cricket, and the especially famous metapoetic image of pastoral poetry containing natural verse with its fabric. Of course, for the frondator, the birds are still in the bush and not in the hand, but the home around them is being denuded for the imperial engine. And here too, we have something similar with the experience of Virgil. What comes next is the description of the love for Gallus of Eclog 10's ego sprouting like suckers from the base of an alder tree. Suckers, stem, su uh, suckers are stems that shoot from the base of the tree, the roots of the tree, um, as in the tree here in image nine. This has also been read as metapoetic, but here the stakes are different. Rather than involving the removal of plant parts, as we saw with the frondator and with the Theocritean model, um, or the incision of poems into plants, as we saw with the Gallus model, still more sympathetic in the sense that it doesn't necessarily damage the plant, but it, it is still violent and it could damage the plant. Here, the amores are envisioned as literally becoming the plants or like the plants and growing out of uh, the, 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 the poem or the, the poet tree. This crossing from metaphor to simile affects a change in the relationship between labores, amores, and arbores, or to use Propertius's slightly more succinct version of this wordplay, between the arbors and ardors of the eclogues. Whereas earlier poets and laborers experienced tensions and imbalances between working and living, Virgil, as author of the eclogues, boldly claims to have synthesized the two. This is, of course, exceedingly momentary. The eclogues comes to a close with shepherds being told to go home. After a long day of work sating their animals, and the sun sets on the tree which in the daylight shaded them. Too much shade after all can be harmful and the project of frondatio, literal and metaphorical, must continue in the morning. The hortatory verb surgamus, 
contains the painful irony that it can refer either to the growth of the suckers underneath the tree or the departure of the shepherds from the shade. Indeed, in a sense, both are necessary because the expansion of suckers would make for less comfortable space for the shepherds to sit. This rather more antagonistic imbalance of human labor and plant life will be more the norm than the exception in the remainder of Virgil's oeuvre. But for a moment at least, in the golden haze of the Arcadian evening, there is a fleetingly harmonious integration of work and life. So far, we've seen that Virgilian pastoral idealizes an integration of arboreal life and poetic ardor and glimpses it momentarily in the twilight of the shepherd's evening rest. Rather than being simply variations on a metapoetic metaphor, the plant and animal matter subjected to human and divine labor can also expand it or resist it with labor of its own. In this section, I turn to another phase of the Virgilian project, namely the tradition of biographies of Virgil, and consider how these peculiar texts affect a similar integration of working and living. It is a commonplace idea in the study of ancient biographies that their, those authors' works become the raw materials out of which their lives are constructed. This has been long recognized as a key operation of the Virgilian biographies especially. It has also been marshaled as damning evidence for their untrustworthiness, right? They're not based in any kind of historical reality. They're just flourishes on the poems. And thus we get a, a, a biography like um, Focus's verse biography of Virgil, which draws on Suetonius Donatus version, but then sort of adds all these sort of learned intertexts um, from the Aeneid and the other, the other poems. More recent scholarship, though, has sought to recuperate these texts, particularly by interpreting them as species of commentary on the literary works. These biographies do accomplish a kind of fleshing out of the Virgilian texts, and I mean that both metaphorically and literally. The biographers, after all, have a peculiar obsession with the poet's body. Given the fixation on Virgil's corporeal life and the fixation of um, Virgil himself's fixation in his poems, his zoe or bare life. Um, it is remarkable that the voluminous scholarship on them has almost exclusively focused on life as bios or life wave, course of life, rather than sort of the fact of vitality itself. By considering how the poet's bare life is narrated in these strikingly zoographical biographies, we can consider how the integration of work and life in the original text gets received. In particular here, there's a lot to say. There's many of these texts, but I'll focus on two, the so-called um, Suetonian Donatan version, the most familiar version, and also a, a much later uh, augmentation of that bi biography called the Vita Donati Alpi. The beginning of the biography, which is common to both works, already juxtaposes Labor and Vita in a richly elusive manner as the poet's father and mother are introduced in turn. Virgil's father is defined by his industriousness and the particular nature of his labor, whether pottery or a combination of silviculture and apiculture, clearly foreshadow the literary labors of his son. This work, moreover, enables Virgil's father to be grafted into the family of Magus, thus establishing a family line in both directions ob industrium. Virgil's mother, by contrast, figures Vita, the Vita Virgiliana, not by laboring, but by being in labor. And this is not just an anachronism, the, the, pun, the, the pun works in Latin as well. Maya, as she is sometimes named in the biographical tradition, dreamt of her son as both bough springing from her womb and bearing fruits and flowers in line with the lit convention of literary miracula. This prophetic dream was partly brought to fruition when at Virgil's birth in a ditch along a road, an unusually fast growing tree sprang up next to him. The brief introduction of the pair of mortals who gave Virgil life thus depicts as is thus depicted as doing so amid labor and rest, both of which teemed with plant and animal life, uh, immediately becoming a sacred space for expectant mothers. Against this more idealized blending of form giving and life giving, Virgil's work life appears to become less healthy in the presence of his advisor, Augustus. Consider the first mention of the poet reciting verses for the prince. While Augustus rested his throat, perhaps imagined as, as having been um, excessively exerted at Actium, the question of his actual participation in the battle notwithstanding, Virgil recited the Georgics to him. 
that is, of course, until the poet's own voice failed, in which case he was temporarily reprieved by Mycenas. The contrast here between the gentle Del, August- yeah. Del, sorry, I think you're behind by one slide. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. No worries. Um, um, that is, uh, right. So he was reciting the uh, Georgics to Augustus while Augustus was resting. Um, the poet's own voice, when the poet's own voice failed, he was temporarily relieved by Mycenas. The contrast between the gentle Augustan periphrastic, uh, uh, and the much harsher passive construction, interpellaretor, um, and the blame for the uh, offensio vocus renders Augustus as strikingly insensitive to the corporeal limits of the poet's throat. The second time Augustus spoiled the poet's rest was still more harmful. See slide 14. The biographer reports that in his 52nd year, Virgil retired to the East, resolving to quit Rome, finish the Aeneid, take up philosophy through the remainder of his life while wandering in Greece and Asia. However, while resting in Athens, he encountered Augustus, returned, returning to Rome from the Eastern campaign and resolved to return with him. But upon embarking only 23 miles from Athens in Megara, he contracted a fever and overexerting himself from travel, died in Brindisium, the heel of Italy. Thus, Augustus caused Virgil to go out of retirement, directly leading to the poet's demise. These two episodes are both contained in the Suetonian Donatan version. But one additional interaction between Virgil and Augustus is added to the text in the augmented biography to expand on a brief detail that Virgil studied medicine before ultimately turning to verse. According to the insertion, Virgil initially comes to the household of Augustus as a veterinarian. He is exceptionally gifted at caring for the master's horses and is given, and with the result that he is given an increasingly generous ration of bread each time he accomplishes one of these veterinarian feats. One day, in order to see for himself who is keeping alive his animals, the, the Caesar comes to see Virgil and begins interrogating him. Learning that Virgil's medical training has made him especially adept at identifying animal sires, Augustus asks Virgil whether he can do that to him and determine whether or not he is the son of Octavianus. But Virgil says, as far as he can tell, the man must be the son of a baker, not the son of a, a Roman elite, since giving out a daily ration of bread was the officium of such a professional. Augustus was so pleased by the joke, the facetia, that he commended uh, the man to polio, and thus Virgil accepts his tenure as a poet in the soon-to-be Princeps court. This is an interesting reflection of how work can bleed into life in ways that resemble various phases of Virgil's own poetry, but we can also read this as reflecting on the biographer's work as well. Here in this playful exchange, Virgilius Medicus offers uh, us a theory of the relationship between labor and vita that is strikingly consonant with the ancient biographer's modus operandi. A poem's works can be observed and through them sources can be intuited, lineages traced back and lives imagined. That work moreover is itself figured as a kind of sustaining, a fact emphasized um, when Virgil is seen playing the role of a doctor while making his argument. After reading this, one's life, uh, one's mind wanders down paths of imaginary alternative histories in which our poet became a preserver of literal rather than literary life and our emperor, uh, humble or not so humble, Eurysikis. Thus, in contrast with the more unrelenting scenes of the Suetonian Donatan biography, this episode stands as a culmination, if however temporary, to the kind of work-life integration celebrated in the eclogues, even if the disintegration of Augustus's violations would soon come growing back. And so that brings us to us, our next and last stop on the Virgilian project line. In what ways does the bucolic frondator prune the shadows of our own work lives? 
I think in true Virgilian fashion, there is an optimistic and pessimistic way to answer that. Exemplary of the first approach is a low, pile, low profile piece of occasional scholarship, namely Susan Ford Wiltshire's 1984 keynote address to the Classical Association of the Middle West and South, entitled Virgil and the Work of the Classics. Wiltshire suggests numerous ways in which the job of the Virgilian scholar resembles that of the Virgilian farmer. Both works are seasonal, unfinishable, fixated on the long view, and done overwhelmingly with our own hands. To be honest, I find this piece to be somewhat sentimental about the work of the classics. It, it is thus striking that in her comparison between the work and that work in Virgilian farming, she openly observes that Virgil was, quote, no maudlin sentimentalist about work. And for him, all the efforts in the world does not obscure, quote, the clear knowledge that one's labor may not result in any rewards at all. I think that Wiltshire's comparative project would be more valuable if she considered how this aspect of labor characterizes his job, or this, this job. In other words, I wish Wiltshire had considered what light her approach might shed on the precariousness of academic life in a comparative respect. The concepts of precariousness and precarity as they are developed in Marxist theory have over the last decade become increasingly popular concepts in the study of modern literature. Cultural critics of precarity observe how modern art and literature cultivate themes of instability, fragility, and vulnerability as a response to the forces of capitalism and neoliberalism. Altogether, this cluster of works takes up the post-critical charge of embracing unconventional affective motivations to the study of literature to do something that is core to our work-life project, channel professional anxieties about our own jobs into the direction of productive reflections on literature and other cultural products. Given its commitment to humanizing and tenderness in the turbulent wake of the cold war machine of ideology, Precariousness lends itself intuitively to Virgilian studies. I suggest that we can benefit from detecting a methodological red line connecting the vital stakes of the research practices of contemporary Virgilians to the arbors and ardors of our poet. Meliboeus and Daphnis can sensibly be classed as a kind of bucolic precariat. Gallus precarious, expunged from history, may be read as a prefiguring of the precariously employed Virgilian scholar publishing and perishing in the shadows of beech trees that she herself may be pruning. By harnessing the affect of precarity in our reading, we can somehow find in Virgil's works neither optimism nor pessimism, but what Lauren Berlant calls cruel optimism. We can perhaps relate to the leaves blocked off by the frondator to create cushions for all the tittery who get to remain, but who we could also relate but we could also relate to the biographical Virgilius Medicus, boldly imagining alternative realities and different lives precisely as, as a daring response to the powers that be. It may at least enable us to fail more humanely. As an illustration of what a rhetoric of precarity might enable us to accomplish in our scholarship, suffer me as I take us home to backtrack my argument to Brindisium. As I originally planned, I included Daphnis in the list of the bucolic precariage, but now I see this claim requires some pruning. As you may know, there is an essential difference between Daphnis on the one hand and Meliboeus and Gallus on the other. The latter two experienced precariousness through quasi-exile and um, natio memoriae, respectively, but Daphnis experienced it through dying young. I conflated them, as we often do, motivated by the fear of the publish or perish prophecy and uh, being comfortable with taking that literally. But then something happened recently that made me feel like I was a fool for conflating someone's work with someone's life. That event, as many of you um, are aware of it, was the death of my dear friend and fellow Latinist, Dr. Ashley Simone. This eruption of the devastating fragility of life into my own work seemed cruelly synthesized with this conference and my composition of this, what became a very emotional paper. In light of the death of someone with whom early in my PhD, I bonded over mutual fandom of cosmos and imperium, this line I've drawn tracing the inextricable entanglement of works and lives seems desperately misguided. For so many people living on the edge, losing your job very well could mean losing your life but these two things are not the same. 
This obvious and unbearable fact derailed the train of parallel metaphors conveying my argument. Leaves are not people, leaving is not dying, poems are not children, and work is not life. Maybe this whole argument was wrong and I should take it back.